Welcome everyone to our Secure Key hosted webinar on enabling a better sign-on experience for your customers by using BYOC. We will have a question and answer section at the end of the webinar. Please feel free at any time to post a question in the question box on your screen. On the screen you will see the agenda for the day, and now I would like to turn it over to Neil McEvoy of Cloud Best Practices. Take it away, Neil. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Here, you know, so, go ahead, thank, you. thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to this uh, webinar this morning. Uh, I'd like to just take a, a minute to introduce myself, uh, my role that I will play in this presentation, and then also set the scene for the uh, for the presentation uh, overall that you'll be uh, you'll be enjoying today. So, as the slide describes there, uh, what I do is I run an online expert community that documents and shares cloud best practices. Now, these practices describe how best to adopt cloud computing, uh, and they come from a wide spectrum of experts from across the world, including consultants, vendors, uh, uh, cloud hosting providers, and also end users who are adopting the technology uh, and sharing their experiences with, with how best to do so. Now, what we do is we, uh, we publish an, an online library of materials, and we also run open standards groups for, for them sharing these best practices uh, so that others can easily participate and share from their experiences of doing so as well. <coughs> uh, we work with organizations such as OASIS uh, and the Kintara Initiative, um, who are open standards groups in these relevant areas. So what, uh, what, um, one of the uh, examples of the white papers that we offer uh, that show there is uh, cloud identity. Uh, and what this highlights is how these um, best practices are achieved by defining a number of specific sub-segment areas as well. Uh, such as identity, <clears throat> and this, this um, uh, describes and sets up uh, the pre presentation we'll be going through in detail uh, today. So just moving on to the next, best, next slide there, maybe a second. So, so the crucial point I'm going to be making and introducing this morning um, is that um, with the cloud computing field defined by these specific sub-segments, um, it's important to, to be aware of these and to build your strategy around them, uh, because often cloud computing um, is, is when, when it's uh, described in the industry, uh, is usually referred to in terms of uh, principally IaaS uh, infrastructure as a service. So this is the uh, this is the role that providers such as Amazon play, <coughs> uh, and and this is when we describe infrastructure as a service. Usually, what most people think about when they describe cloud computing, uh, but actually, as we're describing today, um, it's actually made up of a number of sub subsegment fields such as identity. Uh, and these are as crucial to consider and factor into your strategy uh, when planning your migration to the cloud. <coughs> now, the, the, uh, the, the other second highlight, uh, main point that I'm highlighting there is to be aware of is as part of this migration, um, the identity field and the impact it has is, is very uh, transformational in terms of the impact it has on software design. So it's far more than just about moving your application to the cloud. Now, what we're doing by using these uh, uh, credentials for your sign on coming from third parties, it, it's really having a disruptive impact on, on software overall. <coughs> uh, and what we're seeing is that um, the, the role of government in, in these new design uh, approaches is crucial, given the, uh, the keystone role they play in uh, you know, asserting documents such as your driver's license. Uh, and we're seeing a, a <coughs> an associated field of best practices, such as identity assurance, that's springing up around these technologies so that security practices are using these new credential approaches are, are, are robust and, and suitable for government. <coughs> uh, and lastly, just to conclude my introduction, uh, it's just to highlight how uh, the, the field is really exploding and, and taking off internationally. So we're going to be looking at the Canadian example today, uh, but it's a field we're seeing um, being uh, pioneered and adopted uh, in the UK, such as in RFP, they're uh, taking up this year, and also in America, where they're, they're leading the field a lot as well. So today, <coughs> we're lucky to be uh, diving into the detail of how this field has been pioneered here in Canada. Uh, it's been led by the, the government of Canada in their adoption of it. And uh, the speakers that will be leading through the session today, I shall give you a quick introduction and pass across to them for their presentation. So we have um, uh, leading uh, our field today, um, uh, Risa Whittle from the Government of Canada, um, who is responsible for the identity authentication strategy for the Canadian government. 
uh, and this builds in her 20-year career with the government across uh, a mixture of business and IT, pro IT programs for client relationships and service delivery. We have Salim Hisham, Hisham from uh, PwC Canada, where he leads the Cyber Resilient Practice for the organization, and that builds on his own international career of security work in the, in the UK and, and Middle East. Uh, and lastly, Andre Boyson from SecureKey, uh, with the EDP of marketing and also their digital identity specialist. So these guys are going to um, give you a, a great session today on uh, diving into the detail of the, the CNI set of a high level that's happening internationally uh, through the work being pioneered here in Canada. So passing across to you now, Salim, what do you want? Fantastic. Good morning, everyone. Hopefully you can hear me, and thank you, Neil, for, for the great introduction. Um, I'm going to begin today's session really by painting the high-level picture around the business case for e-government. What we've seen happen over the last decade or so, I think, is going to be the largest transformational shift, not only in e-government itself, but in the trend towards uh, identity and, and the changes there all the way up to uh, the recent advances that we've seen. To do that, uh, I'm really going to start at the global level and bring you a couple of perspectives. Um, we completed recently a, a series of studies for a number of governments within Canada and abroad, really looking at the most successful jurisdictions, and, and 20 or so of them uh, by the UN, UN's account are considered uh, highly successful, sort of decomposing those. The second piece that I'll be talking about is a specific study that we did across Canada in which we polled 3,000 citizens around their expectations of e-government, some of their concerns, uh, and what they would like to see going forward. Uh, and I'll really sort of begin at the, the global level. Over the last decade or so, uh, as we said, 20 or so jurisdictions um, have successfully gone down the road of, of e-government, uh, initially with very simple online services and now becoming much more mature. Uh, of these, and a recent uh, flurry of, of academic papers, what we did is identify nine key trends, and these trends, I think, uh, really set the tone and direction for e-government today, and, and interestingly enough, for some of the, the future considerations that we need to, to think about. And for the sake of time, I won't go through all of them, but in essence, governments started with, with the concept of putting services online in a very simple way, uh, username, password, uh, programmatic access to one area as opposed to multiple services. This sort of moved uh, in the last five years towards starting to look at user centricity. And the concept here is rather than having uh, a programmatic access, so I access one department or one ministry, uh, it's really sort of building enough information about me as a citizen or, or me as a business uh, to drive a little bit more of a, uh, a, a complex environment that determines what it is that I want on a particular visit. Um, with that, I think there is an expectation that online services do need to move to uh, mobile or, or smartphone-based services, and I think this is, is, is a real germination within the, uh, the area of, of identity as well. Um, of course, one would expect that privacy remains a big concern, and it does. However, I think there have been some really interesting uh, happenings in, in that area and, and learnings that we should apply. Um, below all of this, I think, is a sense of simplicity and ease. Re really, the customer or the citizen, I think, becomes uh, the forefront of, of what services should do. And with that, you know, three interesting regions, so Belgium, Singapore, and Sweden, um, have, have moved forward with an agenda that says a citizen that applies or registers for online services should only really provide information once, uh, and that information should then be used by the whole of government. This sort of brings us to the, to the idea of tombstone and, and identity. Decomposing even further, we look at key lessons learned, and there are really five areas that we identified as critical success factors for jurisdictions that have, have done e-government well in the past. And if you really look at them, I think uh, four of them are, in essence, really about direction and governance, and, and the remaining one uh, is, is identity, which still tends to be the, the critical component from a technology perspective. But in essence, jurisdictions that, that lead the field have strong leadership and have a champion, and this is very important. They have a clear communicated strategy. The UK, for example, is moving towards digital by default, this concept that online services are integral and, and they are part of everyday government. Sweden, on the other hand, really focuses on a, a model of make it simple, the idea being the, the least complexity, the quickest uh, availability of, of services most used. Um, citizen engagement really does depend on adoption, and, and this becomes a key point when we look at the, the Canadian experience, but the counter lesson or the countervailing view that you build a technology and citizens will come has, has proven not to be true, and that's, in, in my mind, one of the most important lessons. Um, build something that's citizen-centric, have technology that's simple to use, 
but have that underpinned by a very strong strategy uh, with, with the, the right leadership, governance, and a champion. The privacy and security component um, of these lessons really, I think, comes down to early uh, integration of the privacy commission or equivalent within the, the strategic phase of the program, helping them understand that breaking traditional silos, uh, looking at changes in legislation and policy, uh, to my mind, are simply the, the most important and the quickest win in terms of determining how, how, how to set up services and how successful they ultimately will be. Um, the mandate, I think, is fairly important. What we learned from at least seven of, of the uh, 20 that we think are, are not only very strong but closely resemble where Canada is and, and needs to be really do define the need for a benefits-based view. And the idea uh, that the, the UK and, and Sweden and Belgium have adopted simply is, is this. Make services very simple. Start with the services that return the, the greatest benefit, and they tend to be things like taxation, uh, online registration, licensing, uh, and really deliver those early. Make sure you're delivering incremental benefit, and over time make those services modular, more complex as, as the technology and, and citizenry advance. Cost savings, efficiency enhancement, program activity tend to be the next three that deliver the greatest value. Um, the, the tailing one or the prevailing one, I think, the – uh, the citizen experience or building a better experience, to me, is the greatest intangible benefit but tends to be the one that's most difficult to deliver. So what does that mean for Canada? Uh, in the 3,000 citizens that we polled, I think uh, a very, very similar experience. Understandably, 54% of all citizens in, across Canada did say that privacy was a concern, and, and there should be nothing surprising about that. But when we sort of polled a little bit further and said, well, what does that mean, and, and how would you personally hold the government accountable to safeguard your privacy, uh, what came out was a very interesting result. So between the federal and the provincial um, levels, there is very little to differentiate the expectation of the citizen. And, and the idea here is we already trust the government with issuing us a credential. We trust the, the government with some very sensitive information, uh, and we hold both, uh, both parts of government almost to the same accord. But when we looked at uh, their experiences with the private sector and we sort of polled the same 3,000 and said, where else do you think you know, there is a standard of care or a duty of care to withhold the privacy of, of your information or at least protect it uh, adequately? Uh, the two answers we got back most consistently were banks and credit card companies. And what this shows us is in today's world, most citizens do expect privacy, but they hold the government uh, and the banks almost equally accountable. And I think there's a really good model there for how e-services can be delivered and should be delivered. When we decompose that a little bit further, uh, what we got is a very, very strong sense from uh, the citizens of, across Canada that e-government is, is something that needs to happen. Absolutely, the train has left the station, so it's not really a case of should we do it, uh, it must be done. Uh, what we need to do is really think about how those services are established. Um, and when we looked at the, the concept of identity, 62%, which is a fairly, a fairly interesting number, were, um, were okay with an identity card, were okay more so with a, a government credential. In fact, 80% of people were willing to give up a little bit more privacy to have automatic not notifications based on things like geolocation or locational tagging. The countervailing point of that is when we expressed uh, to them a, a question around their privacy and we asked them what information they would willingly give up in order to get value-added services, uh, we got a very interesting model that came back, really sort of a two-tier system. Uh, most citizens were completely comfortable sharing the name, address, date of birth, and email. Uh, there is a, a layer below that that's a little bit more sensitive, which we'll, we'll talk about in a moment. But when we coupled the two and we said, okay, you know, you're willing to have a national ID, you're willing to have some form of electronic credential, you want uh, government services to be tailored to you, not just based on the information, but perhaps where you are or, uh, or some of the more... Um, hysteric information sets out there in the private sector. Uh, and we asked them for a use case, and, and, and really the use case I think that drove the most interest was the one around driver's license renewals, and the idea being uh, that the, the Ministry of Transport already renews my licenses, they have a biographic picture of me, that's used to make sure that only I am the one who's issued a license. Uh, and so when we said in, in the modern world, what, what kind of service do you think that could be? Uh, the really interesting answer that came back was, well, you know, it would be great if the government told me that I needed to renew my driver's license. I used my phone to take a picture. The picture was recognized by the ministry, and my license was, was then progressed and, and mailed out to me. So it gives you a sense uh, of, of really that balance. When we look a little bit deeper to say, what sorts of information do you think are most sensitive and what should we be careful about? Uh, you're 
seeing what I think is, is an interesting parallel with, with the private sector. So in today's world of, of eroded privacy, there are certain things like name, address, perhaps email, uh, and then in some cases date of birth that are considered a little bit less private in the sense that citizens are expected uh, to give that away in return for some value-added services. And that's exactly the same parallel that we see in a number of other private sector uh, services. What's interesting is, is the information that they're less willing to share. And, and typically, those are driver's license or passport photos, and most importantly, the SIN number. So even within the psyche of most citizens, there really is a, a two-tier system around information that they will trade in exchange for services and information that they feel is particularly sensitive or uniquely identifies them. And that gives us, I think, some interesting insight into how tombstoning can help not only in the issuance of ID, but how that information can be built to generate profiles around customer or citizen-centric services. What stops e-government from happening today? And I think there's really two, two interesting or balancing points. When we asked the 3,000 citizens what they thought about e-service today in Canada, uh, two interesting data points came out. One, uh, the 46% didn't really know they existed. And two, the 32% of the ones that did found it very, very hard to navigate. Uh, and this, I think, really comes back to the transformational issues in that this isn't a technology problem, but having that clear mandate, having that single vision, having adoption and, and the citizen experience be the core to standing up the service still remains, to my mind, one of the biggest priorities. On the flip side, when we talk to them about trending, where does where does the, citizen see, the citizenry see e-government services moving, you know, there's a, there's a general consensus that this will result in fewer in-person visits to government, and that's generally seen as, as a good thing. There are things that I should be able to do online and, and want to be able to do. You know, 32%, I think, did confirm that that, that sense is, is what they would expect and what they're seeing. Um, a smaller proportion, but an interesting proportion, actually say beyond that, I, just don't, I, I don't just want online government. I don't just want citizen-centric services, but I want m government. I want rich, content-based applications to be built specifically around the profile of me. And so the traditional channel erosion does move ahead. We'll, we'll dig a, a little bit deeper into that, but in essence, the web today is the stickiest online environment. But what's interesting about that is over the last year or so, the number of citizens that interact with government purely on the web, i.e. no other access, has doubled from 11 to 22 percent. So there is an acceptance that, that online is the way forward. Balancing that, however, uh, is, is another interesting statistic that says the larger the number of websites, i.e. not a portalized environment but a programmatic environment, reduces visits. It reduces the stickiness by almost the same proportion. And so citizens want an M government experience. They want one portal. They want tombstone data that they're willing to give to result in rich content and services. Uh, with that, though, however, is a strong message that you know, across the government there is still the, the perspective that there should be no wrong door, uh, that services cannot be purely online even if the majority use them, that the government does have an inherent uh, responsibility to provide to those who, who cannot access the Internet. So what does that mean from an authentication perspective? Well, if we take the same curve over, over that, uh, that 10 or 15 year time period, in the mid-90s, uh, governments were first experimenting with, with online services, a username and password, access to one single program, really sort of shifted by the, by the early mid-2000s into accessing multiple programs, the idea that governments should be able to, to start building services or bundles of services around me. Um, the portalization environment started becoming a little bit more sophisticated also uh, around this time. By mid to late 2000, this changed dramatically, uh, particularly in Europe and Asia, uh, moving towards the digital by default policy. And the idea here is that the Internet should not only become part of the, the mandate for government, but should become one of its main channels, and that channel shifting to some degree is part of the economic policy in terms of cost reduction or efficiency enhancements. With that came... Uh, I think that, you know, that maybe the first rise in, in EID or the concept that government uh, issued ID to its citizens, either as part of a national ID program or based on an incentive program. And really, to my mind, uh, on a global basis, countries sort of split into one or the other. So either you've got a national ID program that you leverage uh, or you're issuing a credential based on entitlements or accesses to services. Uh, where that's spurred to now, just in the interest of time, I think it's a very interesting environment whereby... Uh, identity assurance plays a key role today, particularly in those governments where national ID either isn't feasible, economic, or isn't seen as, as perhaps the only way to offer the flexibility around multi-channel, multi-use, content-driven 
experiences. So in summary, considerations and expectations uh, from a public sector perspective, uh, really I think this, this notion that there has to be a paradigm shift, that, that the role of government in engaging citizens isn't something that is optional anymore. I think even beyond online, the concept of, of expectations for mobile government, rich content, multi-platform, multi-channel, and in many cases, multi-ID is here to stay, and it's something that, if anything, is going to become more prominent. The drivers for change absolutely still need to be based within the concepts of, of cost efficiency savings, uh, and then eventually move towards a better citizen experience. From an industry perspective, yeah, I think you know, nations have a similar sort of challenge, and hopefully we'll hear about that in more detail today, around the lack of universally accepted standards, uh, around the lack of implementation frameworks, uh, and more importantly, the accreditation bodies that provide uh, the, the government as a whole with some level of assurance. Opposing this is, is the expectation from citizens that service will become more, uh, more user-centric, that it will become rich in, in content and data, and will expand beyond one to many platforms. So the essential takeaway, in essence, is if e-government is to succeed, there really are two components. Uh, building awareness, redesigning services around citizen centricity, creating new business architectures collectively, I think, is, is what we're saying is the vision, the mandate, and the, the operating principles. Behind that, uh, some real careful thought around what EID means, whether it's a uh, you know, whether it's a tokenized-based system, whether it's a national ID-based system, whether it's a flexible system, and what entitlements and services come with it. So the more incitement that you can provide, the more uptake you'll get. Thank you. Neil, back to you. We'd like to introduce our Rita Whittle from the Government of Canada, who will now be following up with her slides. Thank you, Rita. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. So much in line with what you've just heard, the Government of Canada took a very measured approach to federating credentials and bring your own credential in addition to exploring what a federation of identity management would mean both to the public sector and to its relationships with the private sector. For the Government of Canada, it is critical we find the right balance, of course, between cost effectiveness, client choice, a respect for privacy of personal information, as well as ensuring that there is security at the front door. So what we were looking to really build in so doing was very much uh, an environment of trust or a trust ecosystem, if you would. So if we look at the first slide, what I wanted to provide to folks was just an idea with respect to roles and responsibilities within the Government of Canada as relates to security and identity management. As it currently sits, the policy on government security sets out the requirements for identity management as well as the requirements for credential services within the Government of Canada. We currently have somewhere in the neighborhood of 86 services and uh, approximately 24 departments that are setting out online services um, underneath this identity management uh, federation of credentials envelope, if you would. The Treasury Board sets out the policy framework right across the Government of Canada. Shared Services Canada, as I'm sure you're all aware, very much is about delivering common and shared IT infrastructure. Departments and agencies, for their part, really need to integrate with what it is that the Government of Canada, i.e. Treasury Board Secretariat, has set out as a policy and what it is that we've asked of Shared Services Canada to set up by way of common infrastructure. So the departments and agencies actually need to then integrate with that front door. The Office of the Privacy Commissioner, of course, is very keen on that respect for personal information, and we are very much engaged with that particular office as we proceed with our plan. On to the next slide. From a strategic relationship perspective, what we've taken, and you'll see a little bit of this in the presentation, is very much a pan-Canadian approach. We don't believe that our clients just sit and access federal government services. They're actually trying to access a myriad of services right across the country, at different points, different orders of government. So we have an interdisciplinary joint council group, and these are service delivery folks along with chief information officers who come together, and it's very much a federal, provincial, territorial type committee, and they actually discuss the challenges and opportunities that we face in this space. 
We then, of course, undertake international dialogues, and uh, we are a participant in Kantara, for example. We're watching what other countries are doing, especially our colleagues just south of the border, and how it is that they're approaching the challenges and opportunities with respect to uh, authentication and identity management. And just recently, we have the, uh, the creation of the Digital ID and Authentication Council. So we're watching and participating in working groups to ensure that the work that is being undertaken to actually further the digital economy in Canada is something that the Government of Canada has participated in, that we can use and re-leverage our policy architecture, and that, in fact, it is then us keeping that close connection with how this evolves and ensuring that we're ready for that as a Government of Canada. The next slide speaks to the Government of Canada's commitment to advancing e-services. So there are a number of triggers and there are a number of drivers with respect to how it is that we're proceeding in the federal government. And the Economic Action Plan in 2014, of course, highlighted the fact that we really do need to standardize our approach. Canadians are expecting digital service delivery, and we need to be in a position to be proactive as opposed to reacting to the latest flavor of the day, if you would. So there is a policy on service, and that will actually re-emphasize that the Government of Canada is really focused on e-services. And uh, to the point that was made earlier, there really isn't a wrong door. We will always have channels available to clients, but we really want to emphasize that the most efficient, effective channel is your e-channel. We also have a web renewal initiative that's underway, and that's very much, again, about streamlining the information available to Canadians so that they have a really solid appreciation of what's available to them, currently housed within the Canada.ca portal. Then we have our Cyber Authentication and Federating Identity Initiative, and those are very much aligned to support this whole digital economy and digital service delivery. Our clients expect seamless, convenient, and secure e-enabled transactions. There is no doubt about that. They're also looking to us to make sure that their personal information, as was mentioned earlier, is protected in as much as that is possible and that every step is taken to do that. So we are always cognizant within the federal government of that particular element and privacy is always central to the design of any service here. They also, of course, from a client perspective, expect to interact with us seamlessly. They really don't care whether they've gone to the municipal government, the federal government, the provincial government. They actually want to be able to move through those different orders of government and get what it is that that client is looking for, frankly, with a click of a mouse. And that's something that we're really working towards with our strategies around federating mm -hmm. identity and cyber authentication. If we go over to pan-Canadian collaboration, this is very much meant to represent, number one, the principle that we have engaged in moving this work forward, but also that it truly is about a federation. And as I said earlier, the trust ecosystem is critical to success. Most of the programs that the Government of Canada has online are high value programs and services, which means we really need to be assured that it is the client who is coming to us and that we have a methodology by which we will ascertain the identity of that client and that when that client returns to us, we have persistence. We know that it is the same client coming back to us again because, after all, we are engaging in high value. So, of course, respecting privacy, client choice, that governments do have a key role to play. As was articulated earlier, from a trust perspective, Canadians will tend to point to the government and to, uh, for the most part, financial institutions as those who will indeed respect their personal mm -hmm. information. And of course, collaboration is critical to us, and that truly does then achieve that pan-Canadian view, and together it is all about advancing in this digital service delivery. On this slide uh, is our federating identity vision. What I would suggest to you is the federating credential, so that particular component was foundational to the success of the Government of Canada's um, path forward, shall we say. So the cornerstone was we wanted to have a relationship with the private sector that would allow us to have clients with the ability to bring credentials that they already have, i.e. with their financial institutions if they do online banking, and with those be able to access the front door of the Government of Canada without having to recreate another username password. So with that then came the building blocks, if you would. So 
Our federated credentials means that clients can bring their own credential or they can actually receive a Government of Canada issued credential. The hope, of course, is that as we go further and the reach is broader, that clients will indeed be choosing to bring their own credential. The rest of the slide is very much meant to set out how it is that we will work in cooperation and collaboration with our different jurisdictions and at the end to really, from a future state perspective, enable this federating identity management vision. On the next slide, you will find our approach. So as is the case with most government initiatives, we definitely wanted a measured phased approach. Phase one for us was very much, as I just spoke about, the federation of credentials. We wanted to give our clients choice. We wanted to undertake some very strategic relationships with the private sector. And in so doing, of course, ensure again that the privacy and security components were central to what it is that we were doing with the private sector and with our partners. Federating identity is phase two. That, in effect, is a whole of government approach to ensure that we have a tell us once with our clients so that they are not repeating their information to different departments and agencies that they visit for a service or a transaction, but rather, in as much as possible, up front we can actually validate the identity information and with the client's consent, reuse that information to enable other programs and services. So the bring your own credentials on the next slide was very much about this innovative relationship and we wanted to have this relationship with the private sector because frankly, mm -hmm. it is more cost effective. It actually allows an evolution of technology that we can leverage that the mm -hmm. federal government doesn't necessarily need to be in the position of developing and designing on its own. So the preference here is that wherever possible and when it makes sense that we create these relationships with private sector and that we set out the rules of engagement, shall we say, that allow us to further our business requirements in tandem with what it is that is happening by way of evolution in this particular domain in the private sector. The GC key service is our Government of Canada branded service, and it is very much for those clients who do not uh, have online banking with those uh, credential service providers that are part of our credential broker service. So to uh, the point that was made earlier, we cannot deny the access, of course, to our online services. So this was a way of ensuring that those clients could still log in and proceed accordingly. Cyber authentication renewal is on the next slide, and it's the label that we had given to our federating credentials approach. And this was all about getting the federal government off of the old EPAS technology and into a more cost-effective solution. So as you see here, it is foundational to our federating identity strategy. It leverages the private sector, and much to our happiness, we're seeing an increase in the number of credential service providers or sign-in partners, and we, uh, we are looking forward to uh, those relationships with SecureKey and extending the reach of credential service provider availability to Canadians. On the next slide, and I won't go through this, but um, this is the Government of Canada policy architecture as it exists today, which guides the identity management operation, if you would. So it is critical within the Government of Canada that we have our policy architecture set out because this is actually how we direct departments and agencies. So in the moving forward, we're leading discussions on federating identity with our own departments and agencies in the federal government space. We're using and really highlighting, if you would, the success of our cyber authentication renewal initiative and what that means in actually building the federating identity space for us federally and working, as I said, with the jurisdictions within Canada. Of course, privacy remains central and it will as, uh, as we evolve our strategy here in the federal government. And again, of course, uh, depending on the nature of our channel delivery, the nature of what it is that clients are giving to us by way of feedback, we will evolve our policies and guidelines accordingly, as well as the operation and the relationships with private sector. And again, what I would say is that 
from a, you know, a collaborative approach. We want to ensure that not only do we have that pan-Canadian view of what it is that our clients are looking to have by way of service, what those expectations are, but by the same token that when we move to international domains, that while Canadians might not be in favor of, for example, a national ID card, they would be in favor, in my opinion, of making sure that all of us as partners in us and stakeholders, we bring together what it is that they need in order to trust that interaction and to know that we are ensuring the integrity, if you would, end to end of that service. So there's much work yet to be done, uh, but uh, we're very much looking forward to it. And uh, we will definitely be building on the successes of our, our Bring Your Own credential here at the federal government. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Rita. Now I would like to introduce Andrew Boys and our EVP of Marketing at SecureKey. Hi there. Thanks very much. Um, wow. Just the, the, the content and everything I've heard today is really amazing. So. Um, we, we just heard Rita talk about the importance uh, for the government of Canada, if it's going to serve online, how important it is to get the trust model right. So making sure that uh, both the trust of Canadians is there and also that the government has the uh, business confidence it needs to serve online. And in so doing, it also has got to make sure it gets the, the privacy mix right so that it's, uh, what it's doing is proportional to the service it's trying to deliver. And we, we, what's interesting is we, we heard the same theme from Salim. Salim kind of pointed out that, uh, you know, there are a lot of factors at play when you want to deliver government services online. And importantly, though, that there's a, a set of trades or, or, or uh, things that users are willing to trade to get access to services online. They recognize there's a certain amount of information they're going to have to give up in order to get access to the service they want online because they understand at some level the government needs to know who they're serving. And Neil in our intro kind of also importantly pointed out is that to, to get this right is we're going to have to have a model based on standards and the model has to be open so that uh, more players can come and that there's lots of uh, choices for uh, the people who want to participate in delivering services online. So what I want to do today is just expand on this bring your own uh, credential concept. And so at some level, everybody on the, on the webinar today has probably seen sites like Twitter and Facebook where I can use uh, uh, an existing user ID and password from Facebook when I go to a new site. And so this model is already starting to emerge. But before I want to, before I do that, I just want to build a mental model for everybody on the webinar today about what BYOC is all about. So BYOC uh, is, is a lot like uh, payment networks. So as users, we all kind of understand how payment networks work. Uh, I've got a, a card from my favorite bank, and everyone here on the phone has uh, their own favorite bank that they deal with, and yet all of us can go from here, from Canada, over to Barclays in London, and we can pull money out of the Barclays bank, and we can pull out 100 pounds. And as users, we kind of get that uh, Barclays has uh, done us a favor here, and they don't get a permanent attach, attachment to our bank account back home. And so that's kind of what BC is all, BYOC is all about, is allowing users to have choice at, in, in the way they access services. Taking the opposite point of view, from a web service point of view, it's more like a credit card network. So if I can use Walmart as an example in, in our story today, Walmart uh, is not really that fussy about what credit card you use to access and buy services from them. What they're most focused on is making sure they get good funds. So they'll take cards from Visa, MasterCard, Discover, and uh, they'll take PayPal. And when Bitcoin becomes a, a going concern, they'll, they'll take Bitcoin too. So they're less concerned about, um, you know, what credit card you use. They're more concerned about good funds. And so in BYOC, the concept here is you should be less concerned about how you got business confidence to serve the user and more focused on how to serve the user. And so this BYOC thing is like a credit card, users are going to bring things they have already that are trustable to your web service. So that's really what BYOC is all about. So the, the, just to wrap that idea up then, the, the, the model that we're trying to do with BYOC is move the web uh, architecture from a credential issuance model where every website on the planet is issuing user IDs and passwords and transform it into a model of credential acceptance where users can use credentials that they have already to reach the destinations they want to go to. So that's what BYOC is really all about. So why don't we go on to our first thing you want to consider as a public sector uh, service delivering things online. So I, I touched on you know social media, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, sites like this. We've already seen that there's some uh, emergence of uh, services like this allowing you to use one credential multiple sites. And so users are expressing with their mouse clicks uh, how they want to be served. They want fewer IDs, user IDs and passwords, so that's pretty clear. Um, so we also heard from uh, Rita and, and, and from the government perspective, what they recognize is that they would love to serve online. 
And so giving consumers choice about how they present for services is, is important to them. And so what uh, Secure Key Concierge does for government is allow Canadians to use an existing credential to reach government for service. And so that's, again, it's just hitting this idea that users can use something they have already when they present for service. And so what's going to be happening as we move forward with BYOC in, in Canada and the U.S. is this concept of uh, consumers can pr pr uh, choose a trusted provider that they have in their life and use that credential to get to multiple destinations. And so in Secure Key Concierge, today it's focused on federal government services. As you heard Rita speak a few minutes ago, you will soon have other levels of government being able to uh, connect to the service as well. So as a citizen, I can get to all three levels of government when I want to access services. And as Salim said, I'll be able then to start tailoring how I want my online life to look like with government. So importantly in getting BYOC right, though, is, is making sure that you have the business confidence to serve. So you kind of need to match the credential that you're serving with to the service you're trying to deliver. Uh, just by way of an extreme example to point out the problem, I, I think we all recognize on the phone here we're a long way away from using Facebook to, to transfer title on a house. So what's important is, is that the assurance level of the credential or how trustworthy the original credential is needs to be matched to the service you're trying to deliver online. And when it comes to government, banks and telcos are very well suited to meet this trust level that bank or government has in serving online. So that's, that's important. We've got to get the matching the assurance level to the service program that you're trying to deliver. <clears throat> so one of the questions that often comes up in the context of BYOC is, well, what about security and privacy? How does that all work? Well, what's important here to understand is, is that government ha does have a need to have a high confidence to serve online, but that doesn't mean it has to be uh, done in an invasive way. So importantly, the Secure Key Concierge service, as an example, uh, is set up so that uh, when I use my bank account to get to government, government doesn't get to see my bank credentials, so the details of the bank I'm using, or my, my account details. So it works like that payment example I talked about in the beginning. Um, in reverse, the, the government, or sorry, the, the bank does not get to see the, the government destination I'm going to, and the, 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 the broker who's in the middle, the service in the middle that connects you, doesn't know who you are. And so importantly, what happens here is none of the transaction participants has a complete picture of the user journey. And so that's really important in providing confidence for citizens to act services online, and also important for government to be able to maintain its own mandate of getting the privacy story right. So what's important here also for government is they also face a challenge. Uh, you heard Rita talk about the fact that they recognize the services they deliver are actually in a collage of services that users want to access online. So government recognizes that they're not the only service in the user's life. And so they're trying to exist in that collage or context of things that users are trying to access. So the challenge for government a little bit is that there's a frequency of access issue here. Uh, government has a very important service to deliver, but they suffer from a challenge, which is that as citizens, we don't always go to government that often. And so to meet their business confidence, they need to know it's really you. And it's hard to, to have that confidence when users like me are always forgetting their password. How are you going to be sure it's really me when every time I show up, I've got to reset my password? And so that's been the conundrum of government. And what BYOC is meant to solve is it makes access to, for services easier for citizens, but also allows government to get the business confidence that they need to serve. And we can protect privacy in the middle while we're doing it. So let's move on to... Um, how does BYOC fit in the context of delivering your services online? Before I get into this in too much detail, I want to do a little bit of Identity 101 because we throw around these terms like we all learned them in grade school. And uh, I just want to kind of provide a frame for everybody to understand what it is we're talking about. So an important uh, uh, rubric or, or phrase we like to use is we say identity is once and authentication is forever. And authorization is all about getting on the ride you want to get on. So there's three elements of identity. There's the identity piece, which we use for onboarding, so we get to know who you really are. The authentication piece is all about access. It's, a, it's saying that the person who, who is here now is the person who showed up the first time. And authorization is really the, the domain of the web service. That's really what you need to do to deliver your service effectively online. So you get to decide as a web service what entitlements and privileges I have. So that's really what uh, identity is all about online. So it's, it's identity for onboarding. Uh, authentication for access and authorization for saying what I'm allowed to do. Uh, I want to just introduce one more term before I get into uh, putting this in context. So we've heard this term credential quite a few times, and it's an industry term, but I just want to put it in context 
for everybody on the phone. Most people, when they hear, hear the word credential, they think diploma on the wall. And it, what it's meant to convey is uh, uh, how you access the service. So as an industry, we couldn't bring ourselves to say access thingy, so we, we came up with this word credential. So a credential is really just a thing you use to access the service. It can be a user ID and password. It can be a, a, an SMS phone that you use to prove that you've got access to a service. It can be an RSA token, and it can be a credit card, and it can be a car key. So those are all things that uh, are used for access. So credential is really the thing you, you use to access a service. So I guess uh, what's important here then is understanding if you're going to deliver BYOC online, that BYOC is actually complementary to the way you deliver your services online. All it's saying is that you can deliver the service and onboard your customers the way you do today, uh, but you're going to be able to migrate in your future to a, a service where you were, uh, users can use existing credentials, and we see that with Secure Key Concierge in Canada, and also with the, the, the Federal Cloud Credential Exchange in the U.S., so that these models are definitely starting to emerge. And so what BYOC solves for government is this business assurance challenge, because now the user is using a credential that they use every day, so they're, they're confident and they're, they're able to present for service easily, but yet the, the web service is also allowed to get its business confidence high enough to serve online. And that's really what this, uh, this model is all about. So BYOC complements your existing service delivery strategy by allowing users to come with something that they have already. So on to slide four, and we're going to talk about uh, where do credentials and identities begin. So I introduced this a little bit in my last piece. Uh, the concept here is credential is really about access. So a good credential, in fact, can, can be anonymous. It doesn't need to have any identity information in, in it at all. It just needs to uh, be trustworthy. And so bank credentials certainly have that quality about them. Um, the identity piece is what, where the program starts to say, who are you? And they get a better sense of uh, what, what your identity means to them in the context of accessing your, accessing your service, whether it's healthcare, getting access to my tax information, or, or benefits information. So that's where the, the, the dividing line is. So getting this uh, dividing line right is importantly it's based on standards. So in Canada, the government of Canada has a standard they call CATS2, which is based on uh, or derived from things that was done in the Conterra initiative. And in the U.S., the, the standard used for accessing government services online is called SCICAM. And so these are kind of the standards that we're using to make sure there's a consistent and easy way for uh, uh, services to be glued together in a way that uh, is, is cost effective and low friction and easy for users to use. So I'm just going to wrap up with my last slide here. So one of the key questions then is whether BYOC has to be a direct integration or whether it's going to have uh, some sort of hub or, or, or hop in the middle. So in the social media space that I talked about at the beginning, uh, it is a direct model. So when I use my Facebook credential over at Site B, there's a direct link between Facebook and Site B. And so while that has some benefits, which is it's easy to do and, and it's, it's, it's effective, there are some drawbacks. And so what uh, we've seen the payment network I talked about in the few, few minutes ago is when I want to use my payment card from Canada and I want to go over to uh, the, the banking network in the UK, there's, a, there's hubs that are involved in the middle. So in Canada, the payment network uh, or the debit network uses something called Interact, and Interact will communicate with the the network that's in the UK, and those two networks collaborate to allow me to get the money out of the bank machine over in, in UK. And so that's kind of what's important under this is that by doing that, there's a, a big architecture benefit, which is that from a user point of view, every time uh, I get a new uh, credit card, I'm able to use that over this network a very effective way. And, and as merchants uh, join the network, I'm also able to get to reach these new destinations automatically. So it's a really efficient mechanism to onboard because every time a new user or a new destination is onboarded, they're automatically connected. In contrast, Facebook has a challenge that uh, you know, every web service has to do a direct integration with Facebook. So that's one of the problems of a direct connection. Um, the second problem is the privacy model. Of today, the way uh, social credential sharing works is that often uh, when I use my social credential, there's a full disclosure from the social media site to site B that says all of my details, and so that's not very very privacy friendly. Uh, Facebook has recently changed their stance on this, but that's uh, it's not true of all those social media sites. Another challenge you have when you're doing a, a BYOC model direct versus having a hub in the middle is that contract. So if I'm going to start delivering with social credentials to get complete coverage of all my users, I'm going to have to do one with Twitter, one with Facebook, one with LinkedIn. 
and one with Yahoo. And uh, so that I've got four different contracts, which may or may not be consistent. So with a hub model, you're going to do one integration, you're going to have one contract. And then that has a related topic, which is the service level agreement with social media. Facebook does not want to share credentials anymore. You've locked access to your customer. And because the contracts tend to be very one-sided, you have very little recourse. And so by going with a, a more regulated approach, you're, you're going to have a, a, a business continuity plan in place that will make sure that having gone to BYOC that you can maintain contact with your users. And so those are kind of some of the differences that we see between a, a hub model and a, a direct integration model. So with that, I want to make sure we have some time for questions. So I'm going to pass it back to Neil, and, and thank you. Great. Um, thank you very much, Andre. That was um, a really fantastic presentation. Uh, and really, that was a fantastic series of presentations. I think we were lucky to have such a, a comprehensive overview uh, from our panel today. And uh, on that note, I would urge you to, uh, if you look on the screen, you have a, a questions uh, tab. So uh, if you select that option, you can also post questions. Uh, and in this final 10 minutes, I, I'll pose the questions to the panelists uh, so you've got the opportunity to run some, some uh, real key questions past the experts we have today. Uh, I'm going to start off with, um, we, we've pre-developed two or three to get us going. So I'm going to start off uh, running through those series. <clears throat> and the first one I'm going to direct um, to Rita. Um, and one of our questions asked Rita is, how does the process of enrolling a new user Different, uh, differ between uh, bring your own credentials, uh, different, uh, differ between the BYOC scenario uh, and issuing your own user ID and password credentials. That's Thank a question you. for you, Rita. Thanks very much. So in the government, as Andre just spoke to actually, we have three different components. One is indeed the authentication, so whether that's a BYOC or a native credential. We have enrollment, which for all intents and purposes is about validating the identity information. And then we have the ongoing validation that can happen regardless of channel, and that is the check against the different identity attributes that uh, our clients have presented. So in our BYOC approach, what we wanted to do was to make sure that our clients, as I had indicated previously, had a choice. So by allowing them to use the financial institution credential that they already had, we really were hoping to minimize you know, that state of confusion around, okay, what's my username password to access this service? And we were keeping it in such a fashion that the information transacted there in with respect to the credential and a BYOC is that it isn't personally identifiable. So we were, of course, ensuring the security and respecting the privacy. In parallel, we recognized, as I had mentioned, that there would be clients who did not have that whole BYOC possibility. Therefore, we continued with a native credential, if you would, and that is our GC key and um, branded as GC key so that clients can recognize if we don't have or don't happen to use online banking with a financial institution that I still have an ability to sign into this service. And really what I'm hoping for is that at the you know, in a future state, if you would, that we open up this environment of the BYOC so that the credential service providers to the federal government are actually that much more of an expanded list. And the process then to authenticate would be very consistent for those particular clients and in effect minimize, you know, the, the requirement, if you would, to actually create net new every time somebody comes to, uh, to pay a visit to the federal government services. Okay, got it, got it. And uh, I must, I'm starting to see some more questions appear here, which um, kind of leads on from what you're just explaining for us. So I'm going to dive ahead to a couple of those. Uh, for example, someone asks, what is the ratio of the, the GC key service to, to this new BYOC scenario? So thank you for that. Recognizing that we have not yet, uh, through Secure Key and the concierge, extended the reach to all of the financial institutions or possibly other organizations who would become credential service providers to the government. So I, you know, recognizing that we're not there yet. The current, uh, the current ratio is somewhere in the neighborhood of 80% GC key and 20% secure key concierge. And uh, as I indicated during my presentation, we're really looking to the possibilities of extending that reach because the relationship with the, uh, the private sector makes sense in this regard. In parallel, again, we need to keep a good keen eye on that, uh, the native credential and what that's going to mean to our clients moving forward because it is a critical component of this service. Okay, I'm just going to build on Rita's, 
I mean, I just want to build on Rita's answer for a second. So uh, SecureKey is very, very focused on making sure that there's a, a critical center of gravity for users uh, in, in the service. Uh, so this is a commercial service, and today the, the, the destinations are focused at the federal government. We are very focused on adding other governments and in the future other services as well to SecureKey concierge. Uh, so we have a set of existing providers that are in the network, and we will have announcements uh, coming soon to, to announce new providers. So we'll have more choice for Canadians in terms of uh, BYOC providers, and uh, we'll have announcements for uh, everybody in the audience later this year. Thank you. Fantastic. And uh, we're seeing some other questions come in here, which which kind of lead, you know, they're, they're naturally flowing on from, from what you're describing there, Rita, in terms of the future direction. So I'm going to ask two or three at the same time, because they're all asking kind of slightly different aspects of the same question. And then I'll also pass it across to, uh, to Salim and Andre as well. So the main question is, 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 is looking at the scenario of future adoption, bringing on more identity providers and what's involved. And some of the questions that are coming up, for example, are, um, are arrangements in place to allow use of uh, the British Columbia Services card? So will there be interop interoperation you know, at, at the provincial and other government levels? Uh, and also someone is asking, um, expectations of these credentials will be capped at an, an assurance level of two. Uh, and, and, you know, so we'll increasingly see, you know, more granular level of, you know, identity assurance controls for, for the, uh, uh, the credentials you accept. Thank you for that. We do have in operation what we call our assurance model for credential and identity. And that for us means that any partner, any jurisdiction, if you would, that, act, that meets that level of assurance, we would be looking to how do we create and add to our federation with those particular stakeholders. So definitely, there is no plan um, to cap it at assurance level two per se. All services that are currently online, i.e. the front door of those services, are at a level two assurance as we speak. The difference, and I, this is a very important difference, is that the front door being a level of assurance two for the credential is one thing. Dream. what happens is we have mitigating factors so that, for example, if you're trying to uh, view your employment insurance account, it is about the combination of the credential you use as a front door at an insurance level two with an identity validation process, so i.e. making sure you are who you claim to be to as close to, you know, be beyond a shadow of a doubt as possible, and that currently happens in federal government space in the department service program that you are trying to access. So the credentials about the front door and then the identity validation component, which one would argue requires a higher level of assurance because as I said previously, the federal government, the services that are online are high value transactions. So with that in mind, it's a combination that happens and we may at some point in the future, based on our business requirements, determine that the front door to X service a higher level of assurance on a credential and requires a higher level of um, assurance, if you would, on the identity validation as well. I understand. Thank you. And uh, let, me, let me field that to Celine now. Um, and we're describing, you know, the future evolution of these identities, te technologies, Celine, you know, in terms of broader adoption across the, the public sector as a whole uh, and increasing use of, you know, uh, more, more, more secure technologies for the authentication process. Sure, and I'll give you two perspectives. So, I mean, firstly, we're working with a number of provinces here in Canada that are, that are looking closely at, at the BC model in terms of a, a dedicated token uh, as one way of providing greater assurance. You know, and the trade-off there is, is really the cost and complexity of, of issuance and, and management of cards versus the level of assurance that you actually get. Um, you know, the counterpoint to that, I think, is, is really maybe leapfrogging the experience of other jurisdictions and adopting uh, an identity assurance model in the UK proposal, as you, as you mentioned earlier, Neil, tends at the moment to be the one that favorably looked at. And the idea there is that you're not only distributing costs through a, a PPP structure, but you're also addressing some of the liability and risk issues. And, and the idea there is you're relying to some extent on government credentials and typically driver's license passports uh, on one hand, but you're also starting to leverage some of the other information in the public sector, you know, credit card uh, uh, information experience or, or uh, other credit information is, is another rich source. And by combining them, you're actually providing a, a greater degree of assurance by using that model than perhaps you would uh, of using just, just the ones provided by government. Um, but on a, on a global basis, it, it's interesting. So you've, you've, as I said, you've got the two groups, the ones that have gone for the, the hardcore national ID, 
Uh, and they're also looking at sort of some of the biometric elements. So take the information in the passport, also use that in the card to provide uh, the means of transit. So you can use it as a, a government issue credential. Uh, and also uh, the adoption of, of PKI for digital signature. So to some extent, legislation will drive action. But back to Canada, I think, you know, there is an opportunity to look at BC and, and the lessons from there. Uh, but to, to Andre's point, I think uh, identity assurance provides a very powerful mechanism for managing that cost and in some ways increasing the levels of assurance. Uh, and I think Rita uh, hit the nail on the head in, in, in the sense that uh, all of these credentials will get you to the front door, but ultimately the sensitivity of the information or, or bundled service that you're accessing as a citizen, an employee, or a business really needs to drive within or beyond that portal any additional authentication uh, or authorization that needs to happen. Great answer. Thank you. Um, building on that, one of, one of the other questions then asks, as we're starting to accept these different credentials, do we see the social media credentials ever becoming secure enough? Um, will, will the government ever allow us to sign into their accounts via our Facebook feeds, for example? Um, and if I could pass that back to Risa and, and then to Maria again, please. Thank you. Um, so the quick answer, and I, I mean, I'm pondering this, so the quick answer would be no. So right. when you look to the high value transaction of what it is that the government offers and the personal information with which we transact, and frankly, when I, you know, I think of payment, I think of um, social implications, would we at some point in time look to a social, you know, a Facebook credential? No. That being said, what we will do is look to what the different attributes of the credentials are and make a determination as to what is acceptable and what isn't. So there will be criteria that will have to be met. And currently, the, uh, the relationship that we have with Secure Key Concierge, the financial institutions, as well as through um, the uh, two keys that offers our GC key credential, we believe that we have what it is that we require. But again, of course, there will be, um, there will be that combination that comes to play and an integrity test. So uh, if I can just build on what uh, Rita is saying. Uh, we are getting uh, a little bit over, but what I would like to do is just talk about, uh, you know, the social media credentials today are, are not really fit for the purpose, uh, but I don't know that that will always be true. And so, as Rita points out, there are some emerging interesting use cases where they have a potential role to play, but um, there's no takers, if I can say that way, say it that way, in public sector really yet. I think that will change over time, but for today's purpose, the challenge we really have is, is that, uh, in contrast with the bank, uh, social media credentials uh, can be created by anyone. So, we, you know, if there's an Andre Boyson on Facebook, you don't know if it's really Andre Boyson that created that darn thing. And so that's been the challenge with social media today. But the, the techniques for solving that uh, problem are coming uh, around. And so the last piece is just making sure that uh, the second piece is that uh, you know, the, the, the enrollment, the, 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 the method under which the credential was originally enrolled is, is strong enough. So when you contrast a bank enrollment to a Facebook enrollment, you'll see that uh, you know, banks are certainly doing a much better job, so a better, served, uh, better place to serve government. Correct. And, and the last question is to SecureKey. You'll be pleased to know this, that the session was, was enjoyed greatly by the audience. It was extremely comprehensive. And they were, they were asking, uh, will it be available online post the event? Yes, it will. Thank you so much, Neil. This is Sarah from SecureKey. We do need to wrap up in a few seconds, but the webinar will be available on our on-demand channel and securekey.com. And we'll also be emailing out a copy of the slides to all our webinar attendees today. So thank you so much. We hope to see you at our face-to-face -face event on June 12th in Toronto. You are welcome to register on the page that you saw before. And Andre has a few words left. We have seven seconds. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming today. We didn't get a chance to do, uh, get to all the questions in the list, but uh, if you would like to learn